So uh, I'm, I'm a pancreatic surgeon and I have a special interest in uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, with pancreatic surgery, I also do liver surgery and I also tend to operate on uh, uh, mesenteric carcinoids, which forms a large part of uh, net practice. But for today, we will talk about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So neuroendocrine tumors, as most of you know, have a very wide spectrum. They don't occur only in endocrine glands. They occur wherever there are neuroendocrine cells in the body. And these can occur anywhere, uh, in, in the lungs, skin, brain, but the prominent sites are the gastrointestinal system and the lungs. And in the gastrointestinal system, you have nets in the GI tract and you have nets in the pancreas. So today we are going to focus on the nets in the pancreas. Um, as all of you probably know, nets have this very unusual tendency for very slow growth and progression, but they can still be pretty stubborn. Uh, and with pancreatic nets, there are two elements to be aware of. One is that there's a reasonably high proportion that have a familial or genetic uh, connection. Uh, and that's higher than for most other cancers. There's also a reasonable proportion of them that are functional. And by functional, it means they're producing a hormone that can cause its own symptoms. So when we look at this genetic predisposition, the most common condition is something called MEN1. Uh, it, it's a genetic condition that runs in families. Uh, it's uh, associated with multiple neuroendocrine tumors in different parts of the body, and there are particular patterns to it. And we'll go a little bit into it later in the talk. So in all cases, we take a family history because clearly if a parent or sibling has had a neuroendocrine tumor, that should raise alarm bells. Uh, Another useful thing to do is biochemistry. Um, with MEN1, the parathyroid glands are often affected and they alter the calcium level. So checking the calcium is something that we do. Um, and then if anything shows up suspicious, then uh, we sort of refer the person for not uh, checking, and that usually involves genetic screening. The next step is the functional versus the non-functional. Now, the neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas arise from a parts of the pancreas called the islets. So the pancreas is a gland at the back of the abdomen, just below and behind the stomach. One the main bulk of it is a secretory gland that's producing digestive juices, and those digestive juices drain into the duodenum. And scattered within the gland are small islets which produce hormones. And it's from these islets that neuroendocrine tumors arise. So with functioning neuroendocrine tumors, you might get too much insulin production, for example, and if you have too much insulin, your blood sugar drops too low. You could have too much gastrin production. Gastrin is a hormone that regulates acid production from the stomach. So you have too much acid and you'll get prone to peptic ulceration. Uh, there are other hormones that are less common, uh, glucagon and VIP. Overall, pancreatic nets follow the sort of reasonably good 
prognosis that most nets follow. Um, if they're small, usually by small, we mean less than 1.5 centimeters, they're even safe to leave alone because that, at that size, they don't tend to cause any problems. They don't tend to uh, spread or metastasize. And we would usually put people on a surveillance program at that size. When they're greater than two and a half centimeters, there's a significant chance of spread, often to lymph nodes and sometimes to the liver. And so in between 1.5 and 2.5 centimeters is that gray zone where the risks are slowly increasing and you may be advised to meet with a surgeon to have a chat about are you better off having this neuroendocrine tumor removed? Gastronomas are the exception. Gastronomas tend to be very small and hard to find. So in addition to sort of the usual tests that you have in hospital with neuroendocrine tumors, what we want to do is we first want to look at you know, the biochemistry related to that neuroendocrine tumor. Chromogranin is a test that's non-specifically raised in many neuroendocrine tumors. So we often, most centers would use it as part of the workup. And then in addition to that, you'll, you have cut hormone profile testing which tests your insulin, gastrin, glucagon, VIP, and checks if any of these is being produced in excess. The next step is really to localize and see if we can locate the tumor. Where in the pancreas is it? How large is it? Is it just one tumor or are there more than one? And as I already mentioned, we also look at the family history in case it is a familial pattern. With localizing, the most common scan done is an MRI. And the main benefit of MRI over CT is the lack of radiation exposure. So it's particularly useful if you need annual scans for years and years. Endoscopic ultrasound is a pretty useful test uh, to look more closely at the pancreas and a big advantage is the endoscopist can put a needle in to the tumor and take a sample. M many of you, most of you, I think, will probably have had a gallium dotatate scan. Uh, and that's very good for picking up neuroendocrine tumors. Specifically for insulinomas, which can be hard to find, there's a special test called calcium stimulation and venous sampling. I won't get into the details of how it's done, but uh, it, it, it's, it's a very neat test. Now, of course, now, if, if it's a localized tumor in the pancreas, if resection is possible and it's over one and a half centimeters, well, you, you would be advised to meet with a surgeon and talk about resection. Um, if the tumor shows that there's sign of spread, well, often that spread is only to a few areas and it's possible to cut out the pancreatic primary tumor as well as the affected sites of metastases. And that's a good thing to do. There are a few people where the extent of metastases is such that it's not possible to cut them all out. And it then becomes a little bit of a difficult decision. Is it worth cutting out most of the disease? And will that help? And that's a difficult question. It's, it's trying to strike a balance between not having very major surgery, which might have quality of life implications, 
when it's not going to cure the underlying problem. And we, it's one area we think about very carefully. Now with the familial uh, uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors like MEN1, the decision-making is even more tricky because patients have a lifelong tendency to form more neuroendocrine tumors. So even if you have a neuroendocrine tumor and you cut it out, it's very likely that over that person's lifetime, they will develop more of them. And so it's, it's quite difficult to decide what to do. And nowadays, most people are identified very early on, uh, often by screening in, as a teenager, uh, so it, it's it's a very difficult decision to not subject someone of that age to major pancreatic surgery, which will have long-term side effects. It's interesting to look at the how surgery has evolved because it gives us some ideas to not the decision making and the way surgeons have thought about this. So if, if we go back something like 50 years ago, gastrinomas in MEN1 were a big problem. Now, people had lots of peptic ulcers and they died because of bleeding or perforation from ulcers. Nobody knew why they were developing these ulcers. They didn't realize that there was a gastrin producing tumor. Then they realized there was a gastrin producing tumor. And if you find that tumor and cut it out, you could sort of help the problem. But what also developed was very good medical treatment. Uh, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and lanzoprazole, which can block the gastrin effect. So that surgery is not really required to cure a gastrinoma anymore. So surgery, the role of surgery has also changed over time. Now, when we look back 30, 40 years ago, the most common thing done was to remove the distal part of the pancreas, explore the duodenum and enucleate any tumors in the head of the pancreas and the duodenum. About 20 years ago, people said, well, that does often help the gastrinoma levels go down, but it doesn't often cure the underlying problem. Recurrence rates are pretty high. And if people are followed up for 10, 15 years, now the majority of them have further neuroendocrine tumors. So should we be more radical? And doing more Whipple's procedures became more popular doing more total pancreatectomies became more popular. But then it was realized that they have significant side effects and long-term quality of life implications. And over the last decade, the pendulum has gradually swung back to be, being more conservative and realizing that this is more of a chronic lifelong condition rather than that an aggressive cancer. And maybe it should be treated more like a chronic condition rather than a cancer. So people can have very good life expectancy with neuroendocrine tumors. And so, the, as I said, we're now moving more towards being a bit more conservative. So this is just one example of someone in my practice, a 40-year-old man who had a family history identified to have MEN1. He had a, a parathyroid glands in the neck causing high calcium, which were operated when he was a child. And he then had this lump in the pancreas. And you can see it a, a big... Uh, not nearly three centimeter lump uh, towards the tail end of the pancreas. 
and two smaller lumps near the head. And he went to one unit and a total pancreatectomy was suggested that, that you have three tumors, you'll have a lifelong tendency to have pancreatic tumors in future. We might as well just get rid of it all. Um, and then he came to us for a second opinion. And we felt that not the only tumor that's threatening to spread is the one that's three centimeters. The others are only three or four millimeters in size. So why not just reject the tumor that's the worrisome one and keep him under follow-up? And that's what we did. So he had a laparoscopic operation, just removing the tail of the pancreas, no long-term side effects, no diabetes, no steatoria, no need for creon, no digestive changes. He still got two small tumors in the head of the pancreas. Now, they may take 15, 20 years to grow. He may need a total pancreatectomy in the, in the future, but if we spared him 20, 30 years of diabetes, that's a good thing. So, and, what I find particularly interesting with neuroendocrine tumors is the decision-making, particularly the decision-making for surgery and the balance to be struck between trying hard to cure the disease versus maintaining a good quality of life and not having side effects from the operation. Uh, and that's because people have a long survival even with the disease, even if we don't operate. An operation does have recurrence rates. Um, so certainly in my practice in the last 10, 15 years, I've tended to become a little more conservative. Uh, I don't know whether it's because of the shifting sort of literature worldwide, or whether it's just age and maturity. <laughs> of course, the other thing we do is liver surgery. And often when there are spots in the liver, they can be cut out. And sometimes we also treat them by a procedure called thermal ablation, where a needle is inserted into the liver. And you can see the tip of the needle gets heated and that portion of liver gets burnt. And this is a part of the liver that's been ablated successfully where a, a, a metastasis existed. So in conclusion, I think neuroendocrine tumors benefit from a high index of clinical suspicion because the symptoms are vague and people often go years before the diagnosis is made. They need a very detailed, so good family history, history of associated problems. We benefit from very high quality radiology, which is very helpful. Uh, it's very helpful to go to a net center where there's a multidisciplinary team of people who regularly deal with neuroendocrine tumors. For me, the biggest challenge is the decision-making regarding surgery, whether to operate or not, and how radically to operate or not. And of course, it's a sort of condition that needs lifelong follow-up. What would really help for us is having better markers of the nature of a tumor. So two people could both have a one centimeter tumor in the pancreas, and in person A, that tumor is still one centimeter 10 years down the line. And in person B, it's doubled in size in a couple of years. And even with a biopsy, we can't differentiate between the two. And it would be great to have that ability to predict the behavior of the tumor. And that work is being done on that, but nothing conclusive yet. That's all from me. Thank you.